Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, you're in for a treat. I'm Rahul Bhatia, a journalist, but also someone who, like so many of you, is trying to understand what makes a country ask its citizens to prove who they are. The events of the last year, especially since December 2019, are the backdrop to the talk we're about to witness. Uh, that's because the three main people here, Joy Ma, Dilip D'Souza, and Srinath Raghavan, are in a unique position to provide context. Srinath is a historian and a professor. Uh, he has written four pretty immense books. And if you've ever tried to find documentation in this country, you'll know how intimidating those books are. Uh, one's on foreign policy in the Nehru era. One's on the birth of Bangladesh. A third is about South Asia during the Second World War. And his most recent one is a history of the United States in South Asia. Joy and Dilip are the authors of the Deoli Walas, uh, which tells us a story that very few people knew about. It's about how Chinese, um, Chinese Indians were rounded up and kept in a prisoner of war camp in Rajasthan in 1962. Now, while they were inside, they watched neighbors and friends occupy their land, take their possessions. Eventually, inevitably, you could say, there was an exodus. Uh, in an interview a few years ago, Joy said something about that time that seems pretty relevant to this moment. You know, these are Joy's words. In the beginning, there was guilt and shame and humiliation. Anger came later. If you haven't read it already, do pick up the Deoli Walas. Uh, it's a pretty great book. Uh, now, before I hand this over to Srinath, a word about Karna. This is a community started during the Aadhaar case as a way to help people understand technology developments that were changing India. But I think in time, what's happened is it has expanded to help technologists understand the country that they want to change. And so this is part of an ongoing series of discussions. With that, here's Srinath Raghavan. Thanks, Rahul. Uh, good to see you, if only virtually. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, being here today for this discussion. Uh, I must thank the Karna community for uh, putting this together, uh, Zainab particularly for her enthusiasm uh, in, in getting us all together. Uh, but let me start by actually thanking Joy and Dilip for writing this absolutely fascinating and in so many ways, uh, such a timely book. Uh, you know, I've been working on the history of the India-China conflict uh, for a good about 20 years of my life now. And, you know, I, I worked on it for my PhD thesis all the way back. And I must say that this book was a revelation in so many ways. I mean, uh, as someone who's steeped in that literature, I, at practically every page, I found something new. Uh, I learned to see the conflict itself in so many new different ways. Uh, so this is absolutely, this is a kind of book which uh, comes in very rarely and forces us to, uh, you know, think about a historical issue that we think we know very well in some ways uh, and provides an, a stunningly different perspective, which then changes the overall composition of what we imagine the history of that period to be. Uh, I must say this is Devli Wallace is very much one of those books. Uh, but it's, it's a remarkable accomplishment for a second reason, because, uh, you know, in some ways we all write history because we want to talk not just about the past, but also to the present. At least that's my, one of my main motivations in being a historian. Uh, and somehow you guys have timed it absolutely brilliantly. As Rahul said, the book uh, in some ways speaks to questions of identity, citizenship, uh, what, what being a part of a nation actually means in ways that I don't think you could have quite anticipated when you started working out on this project. Uh, and of course, we now have another uh, India-China confrontation uh, eerily in places which uh, still uh, carry the same names uh, of the period from 1949 to 62. Uh, so that again provides a somewhat more sober and somber backdrop to our discussion today. So I wanted to really ask, uh, begin by asking the two of you, you know, what the origins of this project were and uh, how did you think of getting into this? Joy, in your case, uh, of course, you know, this, this was very much part of your personal story. So perhaps you could begin, and, and, but I'd love to get Dilip in to understand how the two of you came together and, and really started thinking about crafting this book. OK, um, I, I can go first. Um, so for me, um, it was the 50th anniversary of the 1962 in general internment of the Chinese uh, Indians. And um, 
what happened was I had gone to India uh, with my husband for a, um, a trip uh, to explore some um, areas for another trip. And so um, I met a friend um, and my friend Kai Fries said that he was writing a special report for Outlook India. And he asked me, did I know anybody um, who would want to write about it? And it just came crashing down on me because I live with it pretty much, you know, every week, every day, whenever my mom wants to talk about it, you know, she talks about it. Um, every birthday, she, you know, it comes out uh, since I was born in camp. And so basically what happened is I wrote a first story about it. And then I got connected because I was a little kid when I came out and all the people who had gone to the camp were teenagers or, you know, a little bit, maybe a little bit younger. And so they had formed a group in Toronto and I went for that Toronto commemoration of the 50th anniversary. And that's where I found that actually, um, people were willing to talk, uh, people were willing to do something uh, to commemorate beyond just like having the community meet up. Um, and and do, after that time, um, Rafiq Elias was doing a documentary and so we became a part of the documentary and in 2015, we went to India to show it um, in certain um, universities and set cultural centers. And that's where we met, I met the lip. And um, fast forward a little bit, a uh, couple of years later, uh, there was a demonstration in, in Ottawa outside the Indian High Commission. And that's where the, the group presented a letter uh, asking for an apology to the Indian government. And Dilip actually made that trip. Um, I, I couldn't make that trip, but when uh, we met in the Bay Area, I suggested that we might want to write a story. And the reason um, is because Dilip actually knew, didn't know about the, the internment, knew about the war, but not the internment. And I encounter people like that every day. Um, when I say to you, you know, there was an internment camp in India and people's faces just drop, they can't take it. It's a very heavy um, revelation. And so I wanted somebody to talk from the other perspective. Uh, from my perspective, it's always knowing about it and um, and I wanted to bring another voice and uh, informative voice to the story. So I'll turn it to Dilip. Um, so yeah, thanks Srinath for doing this really. you know, I, I want to say that it's a pleasure and an honor to have you talking to us about this. But so, uh, for me, like Joy mentioned, I didn't know about this and as I'm sure a lot of our, 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 my fellow citizens didn't know about this till about uh, about eight years ago, 2012, when, uh, on the 50th anniversary that year, where a Chinese Indian friend of mine uh, came for dinner, and this is what I've written the book, and out of the blue she just said, did you know that we had done this? And you know, I thought she was joking. Uh, I, I thought this, this couldn't have happened, and, and really it just, it just blew my mind that this had happened, that I didn't know about it, and, uh, and you know, then I just got interested in the subject. So uh, uh, in later that year, uh, I wrote a long article about it for uh, Caravan magazine. And that's when, you know, that uh, article got circulated, I think, among the Chinese Indian community. So I got maybe known in that community a little bit. And then, you know, that's how, as Joy mentioned, when there were this series of meetings in Delhi later in 2015, I went and joined them and, and went along with them for these meetings. Just to, you know, four of them were talking about their experience in the camp, just that almost the first attempt to get the story out. And I was so glad to be part of it. And then again, in 2017, um, I made this trip to Ottawa to be part of that bus trip to hand over this letter. And then Joy and I started talking about this. So that's my little history. I just want to, uh, it, curiously enough, the same person who who wrote to, I mean, who told me that time uh, about about this issue uh, whom I refer to in the book as Jay, she, she wrote to me just about 45 minutes ago. And I'd, I'd, if I can just read out what she said, uh, she says, uh, she just, you know, written to me because she knows Joy and I are going to be on. Maybe she's watching. I don't know. And she says, my almost 90 year old Bua asked me the other day, half fearfully, if they were going to arrest us and take us to the camp again. I told her jo jokingly that it's okay, even if they do, 
we will all go together and they will have to give us dal bhat to eat and she goes on like that but i just wanted to say that this this fear is still here and that's a uh, you talked about this 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 relevance and timeliness of this book totally by coincidence yes but I, in some ways i'm so glad that it is uh, that it is timely but i'm also so so sad that it is timely because this should never be happening again um so dilip in some ways uh, you know just to go back to the history of that period um you know the in in the book you point out about how the ball is set rolling for the internment of these people of chinese uh, origin who are in india and there were about 15000 of them uh, in calcutta itself uh, and and in fact there was an association uh, of uh, chinese uh, in india who were based out of calcutta and uh, as soon as the war had begun they had actually passed a resolution saying that they condemn the aggression of china you know they were actually quite proactive because they thought that some of this might be coming uh in fact subsequently they even write a letter to the government of india forwarding the resolution saying that uh you know we affirm our loyalty to india many of us have lived all our lives in india we were born in india we don't have some citizenship papers but please do not uh distrust our loyalties or question our loyalties we stand with the government of india they even make some donations actually yes now despite this uh you know there is a proclamation which is issued uh, oddly enough under the defense of india act you know which is colonial era and the instrument which was used to imprison many of the same leaders of uh, india who were using it against other citizens now uh, you know for instance during the second world war uh, so could you just walk us through to what was the context of the time which actually allowed this kind of a legal uh, instrument to be promulgated and for these measures to be taken whereby 3000 people were then interned in a camp in devli in rajasthan which is where the book gets started from uh shina you know uh, uh from my reading and understanding while i was trying to write this book so the the tensions on that on that border a so called border with china had been had been going on essentially for many many years certainly since independence uh on and on there were there were incidents you know where a indian patrol would be intercepted or a chinese people would would come across chinese soldiers would come across uh, what we thought was the border and then we would intercept them and there'd be some some uh, hostilities you know essentially like is happening right now and that had been going on for uh, for uh, all those years and maybe increasing in some in some respects as 1962 came around and uh, <clears throat> i think it was just that uh, at some point uh, uh, mao who i got the quote from said that if you know if nehru is going to keep on pushing us like this it would be ungracious on our part i'm i'm paraphrasing ungracious on our part not to reciprocate and what he meant by reciprocate really was to deliver this hammer blow and uh, so then uh, out of the blue uh, uh, at least i, I i think to some of the indian leadership it was out of the blue that this this war suddenly happened in october 1962 uh, they came across the i mean they came to what they thought was the mcmahon line and and uh, pushed our our soldiers all the way back and then in about a month later they withdrew to their original positions and that is the end of the war so this building up of hostility and then this 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 sudden flash point of the war was the climate in which all this happened and and by uh, August of that year, 1962, it was clear. I think that uh, that you know, I think the government of India felt like they had to take some kind of action that showed that they were, uh, you know, being proactive, reacting, uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, showing some kind of opposition, some kind of resistance to what this, uh, what was happening as they perceived it on the border. And so, one of the things they thought about was let's try and round up these Chinese Indians and. you know that will show our population that we are taking some dramatic action you know? and i i honestly think that was the the reasoning behind this whole issue right uh joy in the book you mentioned that you know these people uh this chinese uh community in calcutta uh had had sort of its origins going back all the way to the 19th century in india and it's actually around the end of the second world war that we find that the numbers have actually uh you know reached some kind of substantial figure and in fact you know during the course of my research on the second world war i came across this extraordinary uh, cid you know intelligence report uh, in i think 1943 there was a demonstration of 10000 uh, 
Chinese seafarers, people who had basically come on various ships, got stranded in Calcutta, uh, who actually did some kind of a demonstration saying that, you know, we need to uh, be able to sort of get back into circulation, so to speak. So, so clearly, uh, the Second World War and that period is a time when the Chinese community in Calcutta, at least in numerical terms, is strengthening. Uh, but as you also point out, this community is kind of, you know, initially divided because there are two Chinas, so to speak. There's Kuomintang and there is the people, uh, the communists. By the time the civil war gets over, you know, they have to sort of demonstrate and affirm their loyalties in different ways, given what the government of India wants. Could you just walk us through what the, how the community navigated and positioned itself before these events really hit them? Um, I can speak to a little bit of it because um, I we actually don't know that much. But you're right. Um, I think the two Chinas um, play themselves in many different uh, countries, and certainly India became one of those. Um, so basically, going back to the to World War II, um, there was a mass exodus after when the Japanese um, invaded uh, or went to China and started fighting. So a lot of people. Um, got away from Shanghai and they went to Singapore first and then through Singapore they started making their way and uh, and for some reason I, I don't I can't even quantify it that much but um, India was seen as uh, po possibly because of the British uh, rule there it was seen like as a safe haven and um, and Kalimpong actually more than Calcutta I think Calcutta was a fair amount but to me Kalimpong was pretty remote and up in the hills that place became quite a hub for Chinese because um, they had been trading from Tibet to uh, to China. Uh, sorry, from India to Tibet for for a good um, many centuries. And so uh, there were Tibetan traders um, in the early uh, 19th century, and so uh, Chinese traders also came along. And so they would ply their mule trains up and down uh, between Kangtong and Lhasa. And so uh, Hong Kong became a big hub, actually, and uh, the Chinese schools were formed, right? And so uh, the, the way it works is the Chinese schools really help me understand. Um, so uh, the schools are created through donations from the community, right? And so I think uh, it went along the lines of who uh, sided with which group. Um, and, um, and there was a Chinese school created in, uh, in Hong Kong, but I think uh, there were other couple of Chinese schools also in Calcutta. And so, um, so I think uh, what happened was um, there was one situation where Dilip talks about where uh, there was a neighbor who sort of uh, told on somebody else and that person got locked up, but that person also ended up in the camp. So there are many other situations like that, but, um, but when people got released, uh, I think um, some of the families were supported by the Taiwanese government because the ones who had to go back or had no choice, uh, they went to China on those ships from the camp. But the people who didn't go and um, needed, um, some of them needed aid when they got out, right? Because they don't have businesses, they don't have any savings, uh, there's no work. And so some of the families uh, took that aid. But um, as far as the other families um, who you might say were not, um, you know, Kwok Wintan families, they, they they were not aligned to any government as uh, they were just really um, trying to survive. Um, so I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, no. I, I you know because anecdotal. Yeah. You no, know, because reading the book, I was uh, struck by the fact that the Indian government had, for all practical purposes, and I'm pretty sure of this, had actually through their intelligence agencies used the Kuomintang, uh, you know, uh, connections uh, of some of the Chinese community. And in fact, the, the PRC, the People's Republic, actually complains to the government of India repeatedly in the late 1950s, saying that Kalimpong is a nest of spies and so on. And the, yeah. you know, a couple of years ago, the Dalai Lama's elder brother, Galud Hundu, wrote a memoir called mm -hmm. The Noodle Maker of Kalimpong, where he actually yeah. confirms pretty much a lot of this stuff. So in a sense, it yeah. seems like you know, the community actually sort of, uh, despite uh, in, in some ways supporting the government of India's, uh, you know, whatever covert ambitions were in the late 1950s, uh, paid the price for something that, you know, they should not have at all. And, and there was no reason to do that. Right. I think it was a small community. You can imagine, you know, like uh, the, the governments are going to, um, uh, you know, try to find intelligence. Um, but it was a very small community. And I think they were mostly, uh, they had left because they had the means, right? Governments are supporting them. So 
for the people who were taken to the camp, there was not one who was proved to be a spy because no. clearly they didn't have the means to leave and they wouldn't have been able to leave. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Joy, could you talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the sort of, you know, experience of the camp itself? Because one of the most powerful parts of this book is your attempt to go back to survivors, to talk to people who lived through that period. And really, in a sense, stand testimony to that experience, which I think is one of the great accomplishments of this book, is that it's not just a history, but it, it really brings the human element out and gives us a sense of what the experience of the camp meant. I, I understand this is not something that is easily generalizable, but would you just pick up a few things and talk about what you think were the most salient things that people went through in, in, in the time that they were there? Yeah, so uh, sure. So I what struck me was... Um, you know, at the time I had uh, my kids who were teenagers and um, they're grown up now. But um, what struck me was the, the depth of emotion that these folks had because they were teenagers when they went in, right? So I write about seven people and like about five of the six of the seven people are, uh, were teenagers. And so they would, uh, so they lost, you know, if you want to look at it in sheer terms of, you know, how it impacted them, they... Uh, education got interrupted. Some never went back to school uh, and hence never went to college, never graduated, none of that, you know, because when they got out of the camp, they just had to start working immediately to support their families, right? So um, the, there was a kid who was 16 years old, 17, um, 13, uh, 10. Uh, they, they just lost uh, all that school um, and education. But the other thing that they really felt, um, they what they felt was really important. They really felt betrayed. Um, you know, there's a lot of betrayal going on in this this whole story. Uh, but um, as people who had lived in India for so long, um, they were taken with police cars, you know, um, the army would come. Even like my mother, when she was released to Calcutta, and they're trying to find a place to put her in, she had like a this group of people following her with guns drawn, right? And so they would go trying to place her in a place and everybody just scattered because they were so terrified. It was very military um, kind of operation. And so uh, for, for the kids, it was a deep humiliation, a deep shame for, uh, for nothing they had done wrong. But, you know, it, these days when you talk about, you know, uh, when you deal with people, you always tell them you, you've done nothing wrong with but this is like an old, uh, new concept for those days. And those people, uh, the kids just, they felt hopeless, right? Because their parents obviously are sitting right next to them. They couldn't do anything to save them. Um, and there's no hope for being released, right? And so actually when the ships were take, uh, taking people to China, uh, the, the amount of the, the, the emotions that they went through, right? So some people were relieved that they made a choice to stay in India. So they were, uh, they were happy to stay back. But also whenever people left, they felt lost and abandoned. Um, and I think the other aspect of it is the abandonment issue. Like uh, the families that stayed there for a very long time, including my family, they, they were just forgotten. Um, they were told that they would be allowed to return home, but that never happened for whatever reasons. And there were small batches of people who were released. And, and so for the people who stayed back, it, it was just the most desolate kind of um, feeling of not being remembered and no one was coming to really help them. Right. Uh, Dilip, tell me, I mean, while all of this is happening, where is the great Indian constitutional protection system the legal system, you know, we, we rarely hear about any kind of legal challenge being mounted to the internment of these people. I understand it's wartime, there are, you know, legislation that the government can pass. But none of the machinery which is there supposedly to protect the rights of individuals, including anyone, whether you're a citizen or not in this country, doesn't seem to have rolled into action at all. Uh, you know, what really was happening? Why were we asleep? Well, you know, uh... Uh, in February, uh, Joy and I had a discussion about this book in, in California because I happened to be there for a few days. And a lawyer friend of mine actually raised this question. He said, you know, when the Japanese-American uh, internment happened in 1942, uh, the ACLU kicked into gear and, and filed cases and, and so on. There was this Korematsu case and you know, various different things. And uh, at least there was this, this uh, challenge to this, this internment. 
And he asked, didn't anything like that happen in India? And as far as I know, nothing happened. You know, there was, I, uh, perhaps it was before the, the existence of the likes of the PUCL and CPDR and so on, the, the equivalence to, uh, to the ACLU. But I think it's just also civil society somehow, did they acquiesce in this, uh, you know, much like the Germans acquiesced in the, in the, uh, in the Holocaust? I don't know. I, I, I can't help thinking that that's what it was. There was a climate in this country of hostility and prejudice towards, these, uh, towards this, this community. And uh, so then when all this action was taken, there wasn't anyone really, at least among civil society, as we like to call it, who was willing to uh, stand up and, and, and say something against it. And as for any official machinery, I think they were just too caught up in, uh, in prosecuting the war. And, in, and in, you know, this was one small aspect for them of the war, and it was just something that had to be done. It had a big may have had a big public uh, dramatic effect. I think that was part of the reason it was done. But uh, you know, there was just no, uh, no real opposition to, uh, to, to this. Uh, it's, it's sad to acknowledge that, but uh, I think that that's a feature of, it's unfortunately a feature of this country. You go forward, every time there are communal riots, 1984, the, the killings of Sikhs, 1992 here in Bombay, the 2002 killings in Gujarat, there's never really been any serious, uh, effort on, on the part of authorities to actually stop these things. So it was unlikely to happen and it didn't happen in 1962 to these people who went to Deoli. No, I think you're right, you know, because the, the climate of the time, particularly if you read the press and the periodicals, uh, is very strongly xenophobic. Yeah. Uh, in fact, some of the coverage is downright racist. There is no other way of putting it. Yes. In fact, yeah. there is a very systematic campaign of, you know, describing the Chinese in time in terms which you will only think of as dehumanization, right? You know, it, uh, Srinath is being repeated now. You know, I, 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 people are sending me little, uh, uh, for example, a, a, a picture of, uh, of uh, some statue maybe in Hampi or one of, one of our uh, uh, Halibid, or I'm not sure where where some person is showing, shown, apparently a Chinese trader from some prehistoric times who's, who's stabbing the Indian in the back and people are saying, look, the Chinese stabbed Indians in the back even then. So we should, we should know that this, these things happen. You know, it's, it's, it's not new. It, it, it's, it's not changed. But, but if you would say that there is anything that we should learn from this history, what should it be? Uh, that this, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, this prejudice doesn't work. I mean, it, it's it's so it's so uh, it sounds trivial to say, but I think that's what it is. It's we are uh, it just causes horrible things to happen, and we should have. I think by now, seventy years later, sixty years later, we should be able to have the perspective to look back on that war, look back on 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 how it happened, look look again at our our relations with China, our border with China, and then and look at this this huge aspect of what happened to these these people who were put in that camp and say that this was this was a blot on our on our country on our constitution on our on our whole image of ourselves as a nation and i think the time has come to do that and I, and if we are able to do that if we are able to in some in some way acknowledge that in some way apologize to people like joy i mean i really think it would be a it would it would be an awakening in this country it would, it would, peace would break out. I mean, I'd like to say that. Uh, Joy, in fact, uh, earlier Dilip had mentioned about uh, you know, the, the internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War by the Roosevelt administration. Uh, and, and of course, there were about 100,000 of them who were put into various kinds of camps. Uh, that episode had got more traction even at that time and subsequently. And of course, in, I think it was in 1988 that uh, Ronald Reagan passed a new legislation, which then paved the way for some kind of reparations, etc., uh, and, and some restitution of the wrongs that were done to that community. Uh, I mean, do you see that some such thing is important in the context of the Chinese Indians uh, who were so needlessly uh, put to, uh, you know, this kind of an internment uh, experience during the war? Yes, I think it would be really important, um, you know, um, just from even a political perspective or a human I think there are two perspectives, one's political and one's human, humanitarian. Um, so I, I just feel it's very different uh, for countries to be fighting. That's one thing. But you're talking about citizens, you know, what have citizens done to the country? Uh, they just live and they make a good, uh, make their living and they're 
uh, they contribute to society. And so from that point of view, um, the Chinese in India are, are doing that. They, they, they have deep roots there. They just, they love, you know, um, the life they have and they cherish it. Like even for people who leave, um, you know, it stays with them forever. Um, and I'll read a little piece uh, to you guys at the end of this talk. But uh, it's really important um, to, um, to acknowledge that there was a humanitarian wrong that was done. Um, whether there's an apology or not, we always hope, but um, we can't dictate uh, where that goes. But it is important to acknowledge first that it happened, and that never happened from a, a official perspective of, yes, it was wrong. Right. No, and as Philip said, you know, in some ways it is strange that uh, it, despite the passage of so many decades, uh, we still don't seem to be very comfortable and in our skin, in our national identity. Right? I mean, there's still a degree of fragility and, you know, we just get unnerved by uh, things which happen around us and start asking ourselves and identifying who's not an Indian, so to speak. You know, that reflex still remains in place. Uh, I'd like to open up for uh, Q&A. And I'll request everyone who is on the Zoom call to please post questions in the Q&A tab. But while you are uh, you know, coming up with your questions and posting them, uh, could I please request Joy to read out some passage from the book so that our uh, you know, colleagues on the call can get a flavor of both the texture and quality of the writing which has gone into this book? Sure. Um, thanks, Srinath. Um, so I'll, I'll read a short. Um, passage from uh, chapter two. It's uh, Ying Sheng Wong within Barbed Wires. And the reason I want to re read this is um, it'll give you a sense of what we've been talking about as far as uh, who these people are. Ying Sheng Wong lives in the Toronto area. He was present at the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the internment of the Chinese in India. He later became the president of the AIDCI the nonprofit organization that was set up to connect ex internees and survivors of the Uli camp. Uh, AIDCI stands for Association of Indian. Uh, Uli camp internees. Camp internees, that's right. Thank you. Yingsheng is as comfortable with Hindi as he is with Hakka, often breaking out into an old Hindi movie tune as he did on the bus to Ottawa. In Rafiq Elias's documentary, Beyond Barbed Wires, Ying Sheng speaks in Hindi. He reveals that the officials in the camp were shocked to hear that the Chinese could speak Hindi. They had expected a group of foreigners who could not communicate with them. Having grown up in India, immersed in its culture and language, it was also a shock for the Chinese who first arrived in the camp to learn that the camp officials in that remote part of Rajasthan knew nothing about them. The wide gap in knowledge and the lack of information about the Chinese interned in Delhi would take years to sort out. Sheng now reminisces about the day decades ago when his family first heard about their fate and what was to be a long journey from which some did not return. In 1962, Ying Sheng's family lived in Shillong, the capital of what is now the state of Meghalaya. In 19, on 19 November that year, Military personnel went to Don Bosco School and rounded up the Chinese students. Andy Sheer, whose account appears later in this book, was studying in Don Bosco and was among the students taken by the soldiers then. I was 16 that year. I was born in Calcutta and sent to Shillong when I was 13. That day seems a lifetime ago, Ying Sheng says. He and his family were unaware that the students were being rounded up until a neighbor came to their house and told his father. All the Chinese students are rounded up in the school today. Your family must prepare to leave. The next day, on November 20th, a group of six to eight soldiers came to his house. He remembers it was close to 4.30 in the evening when they knocked on the door. The soldiers met his father and told him the family was to come with them and, and to take only a few belongings. They were told to take a little money because they would be released in a short period. The whole family was arrested that day his father, mother, four brothers, and twin sisters. Srinath, can I just... Uh, yes, please do come in. Yeah. Underline a couple of little points that she said. Sure. One is uh, that she mentioned these dates, November 19th and 20th, where uh, Jing Sheng Wang's family was, was picked up. So 
that's interesting because if you look at the history of the war, the war lasted, actually ended on November 20th. So the, the fact of this Dioli internship is that most of the people were picked up and sent to the camp after this war was over. And people like Joy spent five years in that camp well after, I mean, there's five years when there was no war, after the war. So that's something that to think about. Why were we keeping, why did we put these people into the camp after the war was over and why did we keep them there for so long? The other point I wanted to, uh, because I just love telling the story. As you know, I started the book with it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Joy mentioned about how Ying Sheng Wang was in this bus to Ottawa and he sang this song. So, you know, this, uh, I think it needs to be told the, the, the bond that India, I mean, these people still have with India all these years later. And, and, and that shows, it sort of underlines for me the injustice of what happened to them because uh, we were on this bus going from Toronto to Ottawa and then somebody said, because I think Ying Sheng Wang is uh, was known to have a nice voice. And so they said, uh, you know, please sing us a song. And here I am, the only guy who's not part of the community thinking he's going to sing a Chinese song. Uh, that's my stupidity at work. And and what does he break out into? He starts singing, Ajib hai ye. You know, and it's a song from, when is it from? 1962 or something, so about the time he left. He's singing this Bollywood song and he sings many other Bollywood songs on this bus to Toronto. Shows what, uh, it's not just that he speaks Hindi, but he has this, this deep love, deep, deep bond with India. Okay, so uh, we have a question here from Tarangini and uh, <coughs> Tainab tells me that it is the historian Tarangini Sri Raman, whose book I have read, uh, which is a history of citizenship and uh, identity in India uh, in terms of documentation. And you know, it's, it's a fascinating piece of work. And Tarangini is asking us uh, to reflect on the question of saying, you know, what were the other kinds of persecution and discrimination that happened against the Chinese Indian community beyond the internment? I mean, can, can we talk a little bit about, you know, if, if we take this particular uh, episode, uh, obviously there were, there must have been various other forms of what she calls everyday microaggressions, uh, which must have happened at a social level, perhaps even at an official level. Uh, could we talk a little bit about that as well? Joy, you um, want to go? Yeah, uh, I think, um, you know, some of it you can talk to just kids being nasty. So when I was in Calcutta, I, you know, it wasn't often, but once in a while I would get racial slurs thrown at me, right? And so that was in Calcutta. Um, I remembered it, um, so obviously it made a mark. But I think um, the the stigma of the camp stayed for a long time. So when uh, people were released to the camp uh, from the camp. Um, my mother didn't want to go associate uh, or like pay social visits to people because um, they were really afraid that we would bring the stigma along with us. Um, so that was happening in part. Um, and all the Chi most of the Chinese stayed in the um, Chinatown uh, or Tapa area. Um, but, you know, I, I think on a day-to-day -day level in Calcutta, um, people ming mingled and they were friends with their neighbors. Uh, but um, but the camp wasn't very far away, uh, as in those who were not taken uh, were always dreading the knock. You know, uh, like right now, everyone is afraid. But even after the internment, um, normal, regular people would be afraid. And they, they would talk about it. They feel guilty that they weren't taken. It was very com complicated. Uh, but as far as microaggressions, um, you know, it happens on a daily basis. There's name calling. Um, there is, um, you know, um, if, if you don't speak the language well, uh, like you don't speak Bengali well, uh, you, you might get, uh, you know, taunted uh, by it. Uh, but I'm just trying to think, um, it was just, you know, the way my mom says, uh, she just felt like for the 10 years, uh, the first 10 years in Calcutta, there was a deep, anti-Chinese, like it was simmering um, kind of uh, attitude towards uh, towards the people who are of Chinese origin. Um, for me, as a child, I was sheltered from it because I just went to school and, you know, these were my classmates, and I, I didn't feel it as much, um, but she definitely felt it. And a lot of people were harassed by the CID, uh, the, the people who came out, uh, they would follow the men around. Uh, my father was followed uh, a lot. Um, and so those types of things, I think um, it was uh, for people who were asked to quit India and those who chose to stay, it was very, very difficult. 
Okay, uh, we have another historian uh, on the uh, discussion here today, who is uh, my friend Cherry from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, now resident in Bombay, I believe, uh, who um, says that many of the Chinese interns uh, interned in Devli were identified perhaps because they also had lucrative businesses, which were then taken over and sold to Indians. So the process of interning and identification uh, itself perhaps was driven by things which are not necessarily at the national security level. I mean, at the highest level, yes, you are right uh, that, you know, perhaps a decision was taken to send a message out. But perhaps, uh, you know, there were other kinds of issues uh, which played out in a, in a more local setting as well. The second thing, and then Dilip, perhaps you may want to talk about this a little bit, is he says that Devli camps were modeled on the FDR's camps for Japanese Americans, right? I mean, so in a sense, the Indians quite consciously took that model. Uh, and uh, Cherry wants to know how these models of identification and internment uh, kind of, you know, move around. And perhaps, you know, these are the sort of longer term institutional, uh, you know, practices that are now being played out in places like Assam in the context of the NRC and such like. Um, am I going for that? Uh, yeah, why don't you answer that and then Joy, you can take a crack at that. Uh, so I, I think uh, to, to say that the camp was modeled on the on the Japanese internment camps, I'm not sure if the in, in its physicality it was not, I, because it, it has a history going back to the 19th century. The camp was set up by the British and, and has a long history of being used, was used for German POWs and, and in the Second World War for Indian freedom fighters and all. So I don't think it was a I mean, it was not a camp that was built based on uh, what was built up uh, for the Japanese interns in, in 1942. But this whole idea of interning, of, of putting people into camps was, uh, uh, you know, uh, has its parallels with the, with the Japanese internment. So, uh, and I think it's instructive also to look at what, um, what's happened with that camp afterwards. Uh, so it was, it was used for... Uh, at the time of um, uh, when uh, when the Chinese Indians were there, there were also, as Joyce uh, one of uh, in one of Joyce's stories, somebody talks about how there were Pakistani POWs also there. There were some Tibetans people also kept there. But in later years, it became a training camp for our paramilitary units. And for the last many years, it's been a training camp for the CISF, the Central Indian Security Force, which is uh, uh, the people who check us at airports and so on. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is because what I found really interesting was that there, that there used to be a history of the of the CISF of this camp on the CISF website, which mentioned uh, this the, the Chinese Indians being there in just two lines, and it said something about how at um, in in the early 60s or something there were 3,000 people put in this camp, and they were it was called Chinese camp. And there's no mention, I, I like to point this out each time, because there's no mention of the fact that these were Indian citizens, Chinese Indians. So, you know, you, you read this and you'd wonder who were these people. And I think you, I think you were meant to wonder that because you, you were not meant to ask, uh, you're not meant to know that they were actually our own uh, fellow citizens. So, I mean, that's the history of that camp. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and uh, I'll just say that, you know, uh, there is a bit of a prehistory as well. During the Second World War, again, German citizens who were in India at that point of time, for whatever purpose, were rounded up and put into these camps. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Rajmohan Gandhi, who's on this call, mentions in his biography of Rajaji that, you know, Rajaji himself, you know, took such measures as the premier of Madras presidency yes. at that point of time. So, in, in a sense, there is a institutional precedent to these kinds of things, just as there is an institutional continuity afterwards as well. Yeah. And uh, in, in fact, I came across a wonderful set of watercolors by one of the German internees. Uh, you know, it, they somehow landed up in the Imperial War Museum. It's, it's absolutely moving to see how that person sitting in that camp has captured everyday life. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I can well understand what Joy is saying. But Joy, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what is the, uh, whether, what is the kind of role? And in fact, we have Usha Gandhi who is asking a related question about whether there was any method to this or were just people picked up, rounded up, because, you know, there's a 15,000 strong community, about 3,000 people were interned. Uh, Cherry has this hypothesis that perhaps, you know, there were other kinds of local political economy reasons for wanting to, commercial reasons for wanting to send some people off to these camps and so on. I mean, could you speak to some of those questions? Yes. Uh, so, sorry, that sounds in my eyes, but... Um... So basically, I think um, what uh, what someone said previously uh, that um, certain like 
big businesses were targeted. Uh, that was certainly the um, the case in my family. Uh, my family had a very big um, co construction company in the Alipur Dwars area, and so that completely got destroyed. Um, so that was one one piece of it. But the other thing, um, sorry, uh, I'm getting a little bit distracted with this um, sunlight. But the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, someone asked, was there any method of ma uh, to the madness? So, um, so the way it worked for our company was we had a lot of um, uh, carpenters from uh, who were from China and had been living in uh, Hashimara for like decades by then. So they had married local women. So when uh, when the general internment happened, the carpenters were picked up first. We uh, our family was picked up like a month later. And so uh, only the men were taken. All their wives and children were left behind. And um, my my grandfather ran a very sort of paternalistic kind of uh, uh, company where they just took care of the wives and the children. And he promised all the carpenters who were locked up that they would take care of them. So that was one way it happened. It seems to me that in from the people I spoke to, the people in Assam and uh, and Kalimpong and Darjeeling, the whole family was taken, right? Um, like uh, like all the children and, and so on. But in Calcutta, uh, I'm told by my mom that a lot of the men were just picked up. Like there would be two brothers or like uh, from the big tannery uh, um, factories, they would just take the men. And so these men had to figure out a way because they couldn't cook for themselves. And so like you, you hear all these stories, right? So they'd attach themselves with a family who, you know, would, would cook for them and then they would share whatever they were given. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit so from this, but I also wanted to talk about the, uh, there was no method to the madness, right? And so, um, I, and I mean it in like an operational po point of view, uh, wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, so even if the camp, uh, the people in Delhi had taken the Japanese internment, uh, just like a playbook, and tried to play it out. It, it did not work that way. Um, they, they, they were just not staffed uh, to even register the people. Like everybody had to have a registration. Everybody, like you processing three thousand people. Uh, the food supplies were not there, and there was absolutely besides just taking care of like living and eating. There was nothing. Uh, if you were to talk about the playbook from the Japanese uh, camps. Uh, there was no entertainment, there was no school, there was no any other social kind of uh, activities. I think uh, the, the Japanese internees, they had a lot of that. You know, they had activities, uh, even though it's probably horrible and very depressing to do it, but there was nothing for the, uh, the daily internees. Right. Uh, we have another historian, uh, Kunalji Troy, who's actually writing his uh, PhD dissertation on Kolkata Chinese. A lot of historians, Krishnan. Sorry? Yeah, I know. It's, it's a tribute to your book that you've gotten so many of us who are otherwise loath to do anything else on a Sunday evening out uh, in force. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad my tribe is uh, flourishing and that you give us opportunities like this. So, uh, But uh, Kunaljit is asking, uh, he, he has also interviewed uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Indian Chinese in Kolkata, a few in Makum, Tinsukia, and he has read the book closely. And uh, he says that, one of the things which is to him very striking is how even now, uh, you know, the community is very sort of cagey about talking about these events, perhaps because they still fear that they could be presented as the other and in some ways uh, victimized, especially in the context of what's happening with Corona and so on. Right. Yeah. So that's one particular uh, question. And then we have another question here from Akshay, who was saying that, uh, you know, so what have the survivors of this internment demanded so far? I mean, have they actually demanded a formal kind of apology or uh, reparations, restitution of any kind? Uh, so could we talk to both of those questions first? Um, so the, about the, the demands, I, I'll let uh, Joy expand on that too. But as far as I know, there's just been this one. It took a while for the community to come together and say that we'd like uh, to, to, to demand this apology, to ask for an apology. I, I mean, I think demand is too strong. They, so what the form it took was this bus trip that we talked about earlier in, in 2017, where we where they went to, to uh, Ottawa and went to the High Commission and they, they had this letter printed out, which is addressed to Prime Minister Modi saying, we would like an you know, acknowledgement and an apology for what happened to us in 1960. 
too. And uh, so I, I want to uh, underline again what happened there because of these, uh, uh, they, they had informed the High Commission that they were going to come with this letter and that at a certain time on a certain date, but when they get there, the, the gates were locked and they were not allowed in and the, somebody standing at the gate said, we have no orders to accept any letters from you. So we spent, uh, they spent, I, I keep saying we because I was also there, but uh, spent about three and a half hours standing outside, holding up placards and so on, and then eventually left after taping the letter to the, to the gate. So uh, frankly, I don't think that letter was read by anyone. So that, that's what I mean. It was, uh, it's, uh, it was this, this demand for an apology is really just a, it's, it's like a plea that's, that's I, I've fallen on deaf ears as far as I know. I'd like to I'd like to think that the community come, is going to ask for uh, an apology again or in a in a larger form. I'd, I I don't think there is any such move. Uh, Joy, can can you correct me if I'm wrong on that? Uh, yeah, there's not nothing currently planned as far as I know. But uh, I do want to say that before that uh, Ottawa trip, uh, around 2000 and after 2012, uh, they had written some letters. Uh, a letter to the government at the time, so the Congress government, I guess. Um, so they had written it and they addressed it to the president, um, Manmohan Gandhi. At, uh, sorry, Mohan Singh. 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 Sorry, <laughs> apologies. And um, so, um, so it just went into this pile. Um, I don't know how they sent it, so, but that letter had gone in. Um, so there were two, I guess, requests or. For apologies. How, how, for apologies. What, what is the other question? Uh... The other question was about the, you know, the, the, the caginess uh, of the community even today uh, when they want to talk about these memories and so on. I mean, is there still a feeling that, you know, somehow they, they could, even in the current context, you know, be treated as the other rather than as someone who's an integral part of this country? Again, I think Joy should answer that, but I'll just give you one little uh, data point on that. Again, just before this, uh, the same Ottawa bus trip, as they were planning it, there was a, a mail that came from uh, from somebody we know in the community here. In fact, the same person whose who's, uh, little message I read out earlier today, uh, saying that, you know, there is, uh, you're planning all this and that's good, but you, you got to remember that there are repercussions on us here in India. Even, uh, you know, there are, there are people knocking on my door even now, just by the way, and, and, and asking me about my papers and so on. So when you do this kind of thing, keep in mind what's going to happen to us in the, in the community to India. And so, you know, they are definitely worried. They are, I don't blame them for being cagey is the word you used. That's, that, that's the reality for them. Yeah. Joy? Yeah, definitely uh, to address that caginess. Um, everybody in India is absolutely not uh, in a good place. Um, they feel very worried whenever anything happens, you know, on the border, whether we, uh, groups like us speak up. So we have to be very careful and very um, aware of what they're going through because um, right now it, it's very difficult for them. So on, so, so there's, there's that, but also um, people are exhausted about the subject from uh, among the internees because like nobody knows about it, right? So the book actually helps get people who ask them questions a little further along, because if not, then they would have to address everything. So, and they're a little bit more um, elderly also. So there are only a few people who are willing to, to talk at great length if they haven't already been recorded in books or thesis and all that. So um, the community is not that big either. Uh, and so that's the reason why you're not going to get a lot of spokespeople. Um, spokespeople are going to be, um, have to prepare themselves mentally to talk about it and also uh, the people who usually go for the community picnics um, it's all like rolled into the experience they don't like some sometimes it's not such an existential question for them uh, for example like there's this little a lady I met and her daughter um, is around my age and she calls her daughter Dilly because that's her name she was born in Dilly and um, everybody knows her and they're like, oh, yeah, daily so-and-so. Yeah, we, we know who she is. Even her email, you know, has that. It's um, so people, they survive, people are survivors, right? Uh, they're, they're very resilient and they have conquered all this. And so sometimes they don't want to talk about it. Like, um, for example, 
uh, I'm drawing it to a little more contemporary things, BLM, Black Lives Matter. There's some people who, who don't want to go there, you know, and, and there's some people who want to take it further. So you're going to have these people who don't want to dig up the past and dig up everything. You know, they feel that they have, uh, they have got it to a certain place and they're all right where they are. Uh, Dilip, we have a question for you from Anushka Gupta, who's following this discussion on our YouTube streaming. And uh, Anushka asks how you perceive the question of citizenship in the context of majority in politics playing out in India today, uh, and whether you believe there is a graver threat uh, than earlier times, especially because institutional redressal mechanisms also seem to be compromised. Uh, Zainab adds another important point, which is to say that, you know, perhaps now the Indian state, because of various modern methods of streamlining identity, is even better positioned to target individuals and smaller groups and deprive them of, uh, you know, the normal rights that the constitution uh, affords to everyone. So do you want to uh, talk a little bit about these issues? Well, of course, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, the threat is still there. And I think it, it is worse and it is true because of things like Aadhaar and, uh, and uh, you know, computerization of records, all that makes it so much easier to do this, do what happened in 1962. So I think that's, you know, there's, there's no question. And uh, uh, these laws that we've seen in recent times, this uh, CAA and the NRC are a threat to citizenship. And, and for this reason, People say, you know, there's nothing wrong with the CAA. No Indian citizen is going to be a, a threatened by the CAA. Well, if you want to take that attitude, I mean, I, I have a problem with it being discriminatory anyway, excluding the Muslim uh, immigrants, you know, whatever it is, illegal immigrants. But that apart, the, our home minister told us explicitly, you've got to remember the chronology. Our chronology is that We're going to have the CAA and the NRC by his own admission. And, the, and what that means is that if, if there's, a, there's a guy, let's say there's, there's you, Srinath, and there's uh, uh, my friend Gulzar, who by his name you know is a Muslim, and you, they both, both of you have lost your papers after the CAA and NRC are, are in place. It's, you can go, you can say, look, I'm uh, an immigrant from, uh, uh, I was pushed out of Bangladesh, let's say, by, persecuted and pushed out, and you will get a fast track to Indian citizenship. Gulzar does not have that fast track. Uh, so that's the problem. And I think that's the, 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 that whole question that it raises of who is a citizen, who becomes, um, uh, how do we define citizenship? Who's a foreigner? How do we define who's a foreigner? All those questions that were raised and answered in, in 1962, answered by all those different laws that you mentioned earlier, uh, are, are again in focus because they're going to be they're, they're going to be raised again. I mean, we have in Assam what are called foreigners tribunals. There are people who are deciding who's a foreigner. That's and that, that I mean. So this is re a reality today. We are building detention camps in Assam and elsewhere in this country. You know, this is a reality today. It's the, there is a, the the, it, the the potential to do it on a much wider scale is here today, and that's what I'm so frightened about. Uh, Anushka has a follow-on question for you, which is uh, that, you know, in the discussion you had mentioned that one of the th reasons why this uh, internment actually went unchallenged and, you know, there's practically no uh, questions asked of the government for, uh, you know, doing this was that, you know, the complicity of civil society and perhaps even the general public uh, or acquiescence in a situation. Uh, and, and she wants to know whether government-backed propaganda had a role to play in furthering this uh, perception and how did this uh, whole narrative get created? Actually, well, I don't know if uh, I don't know if there was any government-backed propaganda against Chinese Indians. Uh, I mean, uh, as you yourself said, there was a lot of. Uh, uh, if you look at the papers of that time, there was a lot of uh, xenophobia, and that was, I think, uh, fueled by the, uh, or at least uh, helped along by the government of the time. You know, it was easy to just be xenophobic about uh, about this other country that was getting ready to invade us, so we heard. And then that was therefore easy to translate to action against people who look like those people who've come from those, from those soldiers are going to come from that other country. So um, to that extent, I think it was, uh, uh, I mean, the, the administration of the time had a role to play. 
uh, I think again, that's what's happening now. You look at the rhetoric uh, that, that we see today around us. It's not just civil society, but you look at what the, the kind of rhetoric that our leaders talk about. We have a minister who said boycott Chinese food. I mean, what does that mean? That uh, the, the Chinese Indians who, are, who have nothing to do with China, and in fact, even Indians, not even people who look like Joy, who, uh, who run Chinese restaurants are suddenly going to be out of business because of this foolish call. Uh, so, and a responsible member of the, of the government says this, and he's not pulled up for it. So, I mean, we have to be, we have to be aware of the, that these things have a, have a history, they have a, a roots in our, in our uh, governments. Uh, I mean, this prejudice has roots in, in the policies and, and actions of our governments. Yeah, so one of the you know interesting ways in which uh, you know the, the post-war sort of you know, propaganda or narrative was managed by the government at that point of time, which I came across in a letter, was very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's sister, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, was the governor of Maharashtra at that point of time, uh, and she writes a letter to him in early January 1963, saying that you know I've just met this very uh, you know impressive young uh, filmmaker called Chetan Anand, and why doesn't the government of India subsidize him to make a movie of the sacrifice made by our soldiers against the Chinese in the border? That's what leads to the making of the film Hakikat, which incidentally is one of the better kind of war movies made in the Indian context. But nevertheless, uh, you know, we have to see it for what it was. Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe there are movies being made now or will be made about <laughs> the sacrifice of, of those poor 20 soldiers who died in Galwa. Yeah, I'm, I'm told Ajay Devgan has already been lined up or some such thing, but I can't vouch for it. Anyway. Uh, Joy, I want to sort of go back to uh, uh, the, the, the story of what happened after the, uh, you know, uh, the internment uh, experience itself. Because as you said, some people, uh, you know, opted to go to China, which, as you say, in this country was as foreign a country to them as anything could have been. They, they might as well have opted to go to Rwanda is what you write, which I think is very appropriate. Uh, but a lot of people uh, opted to stay on. So uh, one of the questions which Tarangini uh, has asked following on your earlier responses was, you know, how did the question of citizenship for these people get settled for those of them uh, you know who needed official indian identity now uh, was this forthcoming did it take time what is the experience i mean do you know anything from your experience of your own family in navigating this particular situation after the experience of internment itself so um, i can speak to what one one of the um, one of the internees did he was um, sorry stephen wan so for him, um, he came out of the camp, um, he worked a little bit, and then he decided to go to Canada. And it seemed, you know, I don't know the details of, you know, how uh, he probably, he had his papers, clearly. Um, so he went to the, um, to the consulate or the embassy in Delhi uh, for his interview, and he was granted. So I think at that time, um, Canada was looking for skilled workers, and a lot of the Chinese who worked in the shipyards were, the sh uh, were able to uh, to my immigrate. Um, the other batch of people actually left right before 1962 because things were uh, not not looking very good. Um, but on the other hand, my mom tells me that um, because you have to understand, my mom uh, the family lived in quite a remote part, so they were a little bit uh, cut off, perhaps from all the buzzing that was going around in Calcutta. So basically from Calcutta, there was a mass migration of skilled workers, like skilled office workers, because uh, they had to help rebuild, um, you know, uh, Britain or Britain needed people at that time. So a lot of secretaries, office workers, uh, those folks left. They were also probably granted uh, citizenship uh, through, through the UK. I think um, uh, that was uh, their path. But for other people, after the internment, um, they just had to prove their papers. There was uh, nobody came and said, you know, hey, you guys are political prisoners or, or like uh, you deserve uh, to be considered refugees. So everybody who migrate, immigrated to Canada uh, did on their own. And, um, can, uh, and so this huge population of uh, Chinese Indians in Toronto, lesser in Vancouver. And so once one person goes, they are usually able to sponsor their family. Um, so um, so I think for the people who came from the camp, it was a no-brainer. You know, they didn't want to stay. They, they felt um, the country had nothing left for them. If anything, it was just more misery if they stayed on. And uh, they were young, and they had their skills and um, their labor, and 
they were able to to leave um my dad on the other hand because we had a big company and then he was owed payment for certain projects he decided not to go and that was actually probably really very uh it was the most difficult thing for him um so sorry does that answer what you're saying yeah sure okay. uh so dilip a uh, uh, a last question uh which perhaps i should pose to you uh and zena um sort of you know has been thinking about this which is to say that you know how do narratives like the ones that you put out historical narratives uh, accounts uh, like the devi walas really help us frame or reframe older kind of ways of thinking about and understanding certain histories right in this case of course the history of the perhaps uh, and then it's something that as a historian i constantly wonder you know because at some level much of the work of people and mia kulpa including me is very much tied to what the official archive uh, manages to capture uh, whether we like it or not you know history in, in some ways turns out to represent the more centorian voice of the state rather than uh, other voices and and in recovering these kinds of voices i mean what do you think such narratives can really do in to help us uh, you know recraft a sense of what that history was about uh, um, <clears throat> uh yeah it's true uh, history i'm no historian but it's, i always wonder about this uh, history is you know the easy thing to say it's 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 the written it's the it's a history of the victors it's a history of the winners but it certainly is the history of the most centorian voices uh, so therefore i think it was it was really important uh, for us for joy and me to uh, for joy really to to write about these uh, stories of these seven or eight people uh, who were in that camp so it's it, this is this is not just something that happened and and it's kind of a historical um, you know maybe turn that deoli into a museum and you go there and visit i mean there were real people who who were lived there they, who suffered there who whose lives were destroyed and we need to know how those lives were destroyed and that is why uh, to me um, you know when i was doing this writing of this book uh, I, i mean thinking of writing this book it always struck me what am i going to be able to say that is authentic because i i wasn't in that camp i'm not part of the community how how easy is it going to going to be for me to talk to people so i was glad to jump on joy's bandwagon for that reason because then you know joy has was is able to tell those stories with some authenticity and uh, I, the function that this book and this these telling these stories plays today is that we have is, we have so you know cleanly wiped out this memory from our collective memory in this country nobody knows that this thing happened i didn't know and and you know I, I, with some pride i like to think of myself as a knowledgeable indian and i didn't know that this had happened if if i am like that how many are how many more are like are there like that in this country and i think uh, I, i really want this book i really want these stories to really hammer at that forgetfulness that amnesia and and to tell us that this is what happened in our history let's confront it it's, it's 60 years on it's not going to harm us if we confront it let us and i i think it will only it will benefit our country you know it will it will make us a more a stronger a more compassionate a wiser country in many ways if we if we are just able to look back and say this happened we are sorry that it happened i'm sorry to rant like this maybe it seems like i'm ranting but i really this is this is really close to my heart you know and this is why i wrote this book so i can i turn to you you were the youngest member of that community uh, now you've given us this uh, account which really as i said stands witness to what happened in history uh, but, but but can i can, sure. can you also quickly tell them why you're called joy uh, sure uh, so <clears throat> my poor mom you know when they were, they were picked up on june january 25th uh, 1963 um she probably didn't know she was pregnant um and um they stayed in uh, they were put in a camp for uh, a month before they went to deoli and one of the first things she went to uh, uh deoli she found she was pregnant and so um she didn't have a um, she didn't have a good time obviously um and she um but she stuck um you know she when uh, she met a good doctor the doctor was very um um you know doctors being a doctor and kind to her and gave her medicine med- uh, vitamins and so on and so when they had uh, so here's the story so my mom 
had to get a, a pass to go to the hospital to have the baby, right? She had to go alone, walk by herself. Uh, dad couldn't go with her. And um, she delivered the baby, uh, me, and they were so happy. They called, um, they named me Joy Joy, so double joys for a miserable, you know, uh, ex- uh, at a miserable time, they had um, a moment of pleasure. So um, that's why I'm called Joy. Uh, but uh, I distracted her from the question, though. No, I, I was just wondering, Joy, I mean, any thoughts, any final thoughts on uh, how do you hope that this narrative will help us think again about uh, that particular period? It's really about awareness and education. So I think that's our biggest uh, challenge r- right now for all the people who are connected with daily, you know, whether they're ex internees or descendants of the, that group, uh, because it affects them. So our, we would like to uh, we would obviously uh, like acknowledgement and an apology in some distant future, but right now we need to get this in the history books. We, um, we need to be a history book that stands out. And um, it's really about having that awareness that, uh, as Dilip said, makes the whole, makes you a better person and, um, and also makes, um, you know, brings people together. Um, through our suffering, um, we want some good to come out of it. No, absolutely. I, I really hope this is the beginning of a serious attempt to come to terms with this particular historical blot uh, in our record. And the fact that there are so many other historians in this discussion today uh, who are working on various aspects of it, who are interested, uh, gives me a lot of hope that there will be more uh, to be written, to be done. But uh, you people have really put this issue on the map. Uh, thank you so much for writing this book. Uh, I'd once again just like to thank uh, the Karna community and Zainab for giving us this opportunity to celebrate Joy and Dilip's book. It's a wonderful account. I've seen many of you who are here uh, writing in the comments saying you're already enjoying it a lot. Those of you who haven't got your copies, please rush out. Uh, Unfortunately, there are no book signings uh, thanks to COVID, but uh, it's a wonderful read uh, and it's a story that deserves to be read told and to be understood uh, and, and really remembered in these times. Thank you very much. Have a very good evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you.